Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School. This week we're going to be talking a little bit more about the life of Hezekiah. If you remember last week, Hezekiah had reestablished true worship to God in Israel. He had removed some of the old idols from the pagan gods and had reestablished Passover for the children of Israel. Israel's newfound faith in God is going to be tested when the Assyrian king Sennacherib comes and tries to besiege the city. So open your Bibles this morning. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, and we're going to start out going from verse 1 through verse 6. All right, here we go. 2 Chronicles 32 After these things and these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and intended to fight against Jerusalem, he planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. A great many people were gathered, and they stopped all the springs and the brook that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? He set to work resolutely, and built up all the wall that was broken down, and raised towers upon it, and outside it he built another wall, and he strengthened the millow in the city of David. He also made weapons and shields in abundance. And he set combat commanders over the people, and gathered them together to him in the square at the gate of the city, and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, I'm glad you were able to follow along with us in your Bibles this morning, as we learn the story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. I'm going to give you a second to access down in the description below the lesson that we'll be referencing during our study this morning. Let's start out on Sabbath. Let's jump right into it. Let's start out by talking about those first six verses. Hezekiah gets news that Sennacherib is very close and is within striking distance of his city. So he takes some very practical steps. Before he makes any action, he gets together a council of the officers and his mighty men in the city and they decide what they're going to do. Well, first action they want to do is they want to cut off any water source to their enemy because they, they sense that he's going to try to besiege the city, which means that he's just going to wait outside with his strong force and prevent anybody from coming out or going in until because of hunger, starvation, disease, they'll be forced to either make peace or come out and fight. Well, he says, we're cutting off the water. Only the water inside here is what we'll have. The next thing he does is he repairs his city. He strengthens his walls. Maybe where there was a hole in the wall or maybe that where there was some, some decay, he goes about and he strengthens the walls. And the last thing he does in this preparation time is he strengthens the military. He makes sure that everybody has a good sword and a good shield, and he makes sure everybody understands this role and the order of the military as well. And a final act, he gets everybody together and he speaks words of encouragement to them. But we want to ask today, what do Hezekiah's preparations tell us about his trust in God? All these practical steps, what does that kind of tell us about his trust in God? Do they show us that he did trust God or that he didn't? You know, the same actions can come out of fear or out of faith. How can we tell the difference? We can tell because the Bible gives us a hint. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, if we just focus on our actions or our obedience, we're always going to be left to question, did that come from a good motive or a bad motive? A good motive. But if we trust that God has given us a new heart, and with that new heart, he hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the ability to believe in his promise. So do we believe that God has to keep his promises to us, to give us that spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind? As Christians, we also understand that we don't fight a physical warfare. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, it says that, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. How about a stronghold like fear? The weapons that Jesus has given us 
through his Holy Spirit, help us to conquer our fears. Help us to live above our fears. And that's what Hezekiah had done. He wasn't fearful, but he was doing practical things to prepare for what God promised was coming his way. So let's try to understand it this way. Imagine, if you would, that you're preparing for a big exam. You ask God for help, but you also study as hard as you can. Now, studying takes resources. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes maybe a good teacher or a good tutor going to a good school. Who provided all those things? Who provides you the resource to take action to prepare for this test? Well, it's God who's provided these things. So whose ability is really being shown out? Is it your ability or is it God's? Or is it a combination of both? You know, when we find our trust in God, that he has the final result in his hand, we can work as part in partnership with him. You know, our actions don't earn us a good grade with God. We already have straight A's with, in Jesus. He is calling us out of fear, the fear of failure. That's not a currency that God uses to motivate us. He's calling us into a relationship with him where we live knowing that he lives in us so that then we live out from that confidence in being in him. Next, we're going to listen to the remainder of our story. And in this next part, we're going to hear some very boastful words from one of Sennacherib's, from one of Sennacherib's servants. He uses the illustration of a hand, the hand. So listen for the hand and what it represents in this next section in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. After this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, who was besieging Lachish with all his forces, sent his servants to Jerusalem to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, on what are you trusting that you endure the siege in Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you that he may give you over to die by famine and by thirst when he tells you, The Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem? Before one altar you shall worship and on it you shall burn your sacrifices. Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands at all able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who among all the gods of those nations that my fathers devoted to destruction was able to deliver his people from my hand that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? Now therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you in this fashion, and do not believe him. For no god of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my fathers. How much less will your god deliver you out of my hand? And his servants said still more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. And he wrote letters to cast contempt on the Lord, the God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, like the gods of the nations of the lands who have not delivered their people from my hands, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. And they shouted it with a loud voice in the language of Judah to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall, to frighten and terrify them, in order that they might take the city. And they spoke of the God of Jerusalem as they spoke of the gods of the peoples of the earth, which are the work of men's hands. Then Hezekiah the king and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed because of this and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel, who cut off all the mighty warriors and commanders and officers in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he came into the house of his God, 
some of his own sons struck him down there with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib king of Assyria and from the hand of all his enemies, and he provided for them on every side. In the Sunday portion of our lesson, it instructs us to dig in deeper to Sennacherib's tactics. You see, during a siege, the attacking army does whatever it takes to get the siege over as quick as possible. They're far away from home. They're having to wait it out with limited resources. So what they do is they send messages, sometimes disguised as peace messages, to help to break down the confidence and the morale of their enemies. And Sennacherib's message hits the people of Jerusalem right in the heart. And the heart of that is, is Hezekiah's faith in God. What did Sennacherib remind God's people of to try to weaken their faith? Did you catch it? You see, Sennacherib, he understood that gods were dependent on human beings to enact their will or to get done what they wanted done. What he didn't understand about the God of Israel was that this God who created everything operates above human dependence, but yet he invites humans to participate with him in faith. That's what Sennacherib didn't understand. He didn't understand who this God really is, this God of Hezekiah. And the message to the children of Israel at this point is, do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. He is real. He is ready and able to defend his people. In the Monday portion of our lesson, we're reminded of the last verse of the section of scripture we covered. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 22. It says, The Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. And you see, what the lesson wants us to discuss, and I think would be a helpful thing for us to look at, is how different versions of the Bible, different translations of the Bible, finish this next statement. So if you'll look along with me, in the NIV version, it says he took care of them on every side. In the King James version, it says he guided them on every side. In the Common English Bible, it says giving them rest on all sides. And then in the English Standard Version, it says he provided for them on every side. Which one speaks the most to you? Which one is most encouraging to you? You know, certain times the Bible can speak to our emotions and our emotions don't reign in our heart. Jesus sits on the throne of our hearts, but our emotions can be indicators for us in understanding how we're responding to the truth that God is bringing to us. Each of us at different times realize we have different needs. And different versions of the Bible describe God in different ways, even sometime in the same verse. So let's look at them. Which one speaks to you? Does it speak to you that God will take care of you or that God will guide you? Are you in need of guidance this morning from God? What about rest? Are you in need of true rest, peace in your heart? Do you need rest? Do you need to see a God who's, will, who's going to provide for you in this time of need that you're going through? In Tuesday's portion of the lesson, it leads out with a quote from our flashlight, which is found on the first page of the lesson. The first little sentence of that flashlight quote says, Nothing more quickly inspires faith than the exercise of faith. You see, the Bible describes Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who wrote it. And he's the one who's going to finish it. So how does that relate to us exercising our faith? You see, our faith is a response to Jesus' faithfulness toward us. You don't have to stir up faith in your own heart. You have to respond to God's faithfulness to you. It's all about him. It's all about his love and his care and his protection that inspires us to have faith in him. Another time that the children of Israel were facing an army, God said this through one of their prophets. 
It says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. What a great reminder for us and those of you who are listening this morning who might be going through struggles, that this struggle doesn't belong to you. You know, the pain, the heartache that you're going through right now, Jesus has taken that upon himself. He paid the price for the wrongs that you've done to others and the wrongs done to you. He can lift that burden. And in fact, he already has lifted that burden. If we'll reach out in faith to his faithful hand lifting that burden from us, we can experience the peace that he's offering to us. In John 15 verse 5, it paints a beautiful picture of us abiding in Jesus, us pitching our tent in his campground, us linking in with the power that he has to provide for us. And thinking about that verse, I want to ask you this question. Does the knowledge of your experience in the past of God's guidance and protection give you hope for the future? Can you remember times that God was faithful towards you? That he guided and protected you? Does that give you hope? I sure hope it does. In John 15 verse 5 it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. We can have confidence that although we might not be able to bring to mind every moment of the day God's goodness and his faithfulness, that we're still connected with him. And that the situations we're in are working to bear good fruit because we're connected with him. And that's what really matters. The situation sometimes can speak louder than truth. But Jesus is working in us a work that maybe sometime we don't see. But we're connected to the true vine. And he is working in us to produce much fruit. All right, it's craft time. In the Wednesday part of our lesson, it suggests us to make a craft as a reminder of some of the verses we've gone over this week and some of the ideas we've been discussing. So, grab a piece of paper at home, kind of like this. I took a piece of construction paper and just cut it from side to side. So what I want you to do is write down on this one of the Bible verses that's about to pop up on the screen. And then you can slide it into your Bible as a bookmark this week to remind you of God's faithfulness towards you. Now here are some of your options of verses you can write down. Or if you have a favorite verse that you want to commit to memory or that you want to have a little token of remembrance of, then write that one down. Today I chose, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. I'm going to slide that in my Bible this week and I encourage you to do the same with the verse that you chose. At the end of Tuesday's lesson, it kind of left some open-ended questions about calling back to memory God's faithfulness in the past and how that will strengthen our current experience. But what if I don't have a vast experience with God? The Bible verse that's in the lesson for Thursday says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Do you ever feel that your faith is kind of like this little horse here? you're just learning to walk? Do you have trouble trusting God because you don't have a lot of experience in trusting with Him? What can we do then? I want to suggest to you the power of the interview. Never underestimate what you can learn from the experience of others. Talk to a parent, a teacher, or a friend who's been a Christian longer than you have. Ask them for examples of times God has proven His ability to take care of them. And once you do, ask yourself this question. How do their experiences encourage me? How do their experiences with Jesus teach me about how my experience can be enriched? Congratulations! You've made it to the last day of our lessons this week. The last day we have is Friday, right before we meet together on Sabbath morning to discuss this lesson. We're sorry that you can't meet with us this morning in person, but we want to let you know that you're invited to come meet with us at church. I know this coronavirus thing has caused us to be separate for good reason, but if you feel your immune system's strong enough and if you're willing to take some of the precautions we're taking, I want to invite you to come on back. We're meeting 
at 9.30 every Sabbath morning at Highland. All right, so let's go over Friday and let's close up our Sabbath school this morning. Friday's part of the lesson leads off with this verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? And this quote follows it. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. You know, our past and our experience speak pretty loud when it comes to the way we interpret the present and the future. And God's truth helps to refine our experiences to be able to stand on the truths that he's shown us and the, tr the truths that he's established in our lives. Now, if that comes through the way that we learn through a Bible story, like through Hezekiah's story this week, or if it comes through a friend or a parent or a teacher who's instructing us in the ways of righteousness, telling us their experience with a faithful God, no matter how it is, we should store up those memories. We should write down those stories, put them away in your mind so that you can have confidence in the future about a God who will take care of you, a God who will guide you, a God who protects you. That vast army that King Hezekiah met must have been pretty intimidating. And the words that Sennacherib said must have really challenged their faith. They had done everything that God had inspired them and instructed them to do. They had cut off the water source, they had repaired the wall, they had fortified their armies with swords and shields, and they had to wait that their faith would be tested. They knew that God had been faithful to them up until this point, and they knew that they couldn't do this alone. The same is true for us. We can do a lot of practical things to our benefit in this life, but we need to know that from the beginning up until this point and into the future, it's all about Jesus. Jesus provides us with so many blessings to be able to do and act like him and to love others like him. So let's give him the praise and the glory he deserves and the gratitude that should come from us to thank him even though we don't see him working all the time. We can know that he is at work and that he is using us as his, his handiwork to bless the world around us. And we can have trust that ultimately our hope is in him. For the times where our emotions might speak louder than the truth, our hope is in Jesus. And the more we place our hope in him, the more we instill our trust in him, the more our faith will grow. We'll become stronger and stronger in faith because it's his faithfulness that we're responding to. Our dear Jesus, we just thank you so much that you've been faithful to us, that you've fulfilled your promises to us, and that you never let us go without. So Father, I just pray that this morning as we've discussed these things and as we've put these words and these truths into our hearts, I pray that you will bring them back to our memory in the future when we need them. And Lord, as we carry around that Bible verse on the piece of paper that we've tucked in our Bible, I pray that that will be a reminder to us that you are a faithful God who can protect, guide, and be trusted. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind you again that we're meeting each week at 9.30, live, face-to-face -face Sabbath school. But until then, I hope you have a great week. Goodbye.